Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of From the Bottom Up. <sighs> yeah, I feel it's going to probably be an emotional one for some reason. I was up pretty early doing some journaling, and I feel speaking with Jesus of the Spirit. And so I've got a list of five things or so to go over with David when when it's time, but I thought we could open up with a song from Ricky and Emily in um, in Kinta, and after I heard them singing on their show, which, yeah, it was really, <laughs> it was very beautiful to me, and I was reminded of a while ago, Ricky and I were both guided to see a movie called Come Sunday at the same time, independently, and not even knowing it. And then the next morning, we told each other about it. And it was like, what? Oh, my God. Didn't touch everybody in the community the same way. But for us, it was it was pretty profound because it was all about this preacher that he was kind of a famous preacher. I forget his name. Um, but he went to this Oral Roberts University and he was kind of famous in America. And basically, he was giving this sermon and then one day, God spoke to him when he saw these uh, the Rwandan crisis, I think, like a million people being massacred. And he was like, how can all of those children go to hell? And God, God basically said, oh, I would, I would never do that. That's your theology. And it like totally, it totally shook him up. And it took him through this awakening process that probably got him closer towards the Course in Miracles. But Ricky saw it and it had a profound impact on her in terms of her direction that she's inspired by for a ministry. And so she had this song that came in right after that. And this is, this is the song. So go ahead, Ricky and Emily. <laughs> Never 
innocent look deep within what if we're loved what next then where do we go when it's time to end the show cause we won't pretend What if we exist somewhere else in bliss? We've always been at home. What if we made it up and it's all a puff of dust? Show me what I believe So I can be set free Learn how to forgive I give it all to you So I can be made new How do I forgive? How do I forgive? What am I believing that can't be love? What am I seeing that don't seem like a love? So I must be That I love to love 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 Show me what I believe So I can be set free Learn how to forgive I give it all to you So I can be made new How do I forgive? How do I What if we're loved? What next then? Oh, thank you. Thanks, Ricky and Emily. They just put that together in 45 minutes, or at least Emily's part. <laughs> hmm. Well, it's kind of amazing that that movie would come to mind, or that song, because of that movie, because the main character had to go through all of this undoing to the extent he was able, because he, he was judging against, uh, I think, gays and lesbians and didn't quite understand. He had his heart open, but he didn't quite understand. So actually, Ricky took that song and she's like, I'm going to go preach. That's, she wants that to be her ministry. To like, In the end, he was preaching to them as well and bringing them all into the kingdom. But I feel how it's appropriate for me is um, yeah, I don't really know exactly how to talk about this, but <clears throat> Yeah, as Ricky said on the show, Emily and my divorce actually got, I think, finalized yesterday. And it's been a kind of an emotional week, and I didn't really know why. Like, 
Um, yeah, some of you know I went for that surgery many months ago, and there's still some remnants moving through, so I visited an acupuncturist, and after I did, it seemed to be like I was up for two nights wide awake, and I didn't know if it was that or some of the guidance that's been coming through or a deeper issue to be healed. And so I'm kind of hoping that the, by the end of this show, the real, the deepest thing that I can get in touch with will be, yeah, revealed. Um, but what I started out with the journaling was, because I, <laughs> it's always a radical, okay. So in the relationship um, with Emily, I would perceive a lot of times this demand coming at me and even anger and I didn't know how to respond a lot of the times. It would be like, okay, that's just not for me right now or practice love and forgiveness and whatever, but I didn't really understand the full extent of it. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, since I'll, before the relationship was maximized that I really did maximize the lesson. So this is how the journaling started out. Emily was your anger acted out, but also your love acted out. And it's like, okay. And I didn't really know, you know, if there was anger down there or how much, how to get in touch with it. And so it was kind of a shock. To, it's obvious, right? We talk about that all the time, but for some reason it really touched me that, okay. It really wasn't personal, but also... Um, then I thought, okay, well, did I just waste an opportunity then if I just see that now? And then, the, okay, it kept going. It's time to make a concerted effort to eradicate sin <laughs> from your life. <laughs> so <laughs> right before, that was the one line I checked with Frances. I'm like, if I say this, it's, she's like, remember, sin's a mistake. It's like, okay, good, I can say that. <laughs> so this is what I want your show to be about. Okay, number one, the importance of words. What you say reflects what you think. At this stage of the journey, it's important that you don't... You don't add extra weight to the ego. I can't even read. <laughs> trying to like find. You must be willing to be patient for your own sake. The consequences are heavier. So I thought I'd just start with that one, like... The thought that comes in is like we talk about expressing actually lightens the load. But with this, it, it can seem to contradict it, but I resonate with it. I resonate with that idea. And I'm having experiences of that where I just say certain things or if it's not perfectly coming from love, like the, it just like takes so much energy to fix it. And whereas before it was just an expression, now it's like it doesn't work that way. So yeah, I thought maybe we could talk about that one first, David. Yeah. Hi. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Well, it it's reminds me of an idea from the course that uh that uh that you have enormous uh tolerance but that your tolerance is not uh without limit and so i would say it's like the, the deeper you go into your mind the more you expose the error the closer you come toward the correction um you might say it gets it gets more intense because it's like the ego is like saying well you're getting a little too close now so the projections can get sharper the the compromises that you were used to making, the, the justifications, the rationalizations, the, the compromises, now they're starting to be uh, seen for what they are. And there's a, a huge intensity with that because uh, the tolerance of mind wandering, the tolerance of the ego is not without limits. It's like um, now it, it gets down to, okay, uh, this has all been about accepting the correction. And, and so you might say some, some forms of sin, to use the word that you journaled, you know, uh, still seem to be attractive. There's certain um, things with the body, 
uh, comforts, conveniences, things that are still um, really part of pride, but, but the pride is a big compromise because you, you know, how is pride a compromise? Well, it, to deny that you're the Christ and to accept something else is an enormous compromise on a scale that's absolutely unimaginable. And then as we go closer towards the correction, then the intensity just gets stronger and stronger. And, um, you know, it reminds me of the, the, the three lessons of the Holy Spirit, and it's, it's mm. Um, mm. be vigilant for God and his kingdom. And that's a very interesting word, vigilant. Uh, the Holy Spirit asking us to be vigilant for God and his kingdom is, is basically saying, you know, now I really have to want the solution more than the problem. Now I really have to want the answer more than the question. Now I really have to want the peace of God more than the, the compromises, more than the distractions, more than the game playing. And so I would just say that that's, that's what's going on. And, and it always has to come when the mind's ready, when the mind is, is ready for this deepening, for like deepening, diving deeper towards the atonement. The mind is ready, and so to use the phrase that Frank uh, shared earlier on, to bring it on, you know, he, he was like, he's been saying, bring it on, bring it on, with, with a lot of enthusiasm, and then remembering that I had said, well, just be careful uh, what you ask for when you, when you say that to the Holy Spirit. You know, it's, it's a huge invitation for exposing, for, you know, releasing the compromises. And so I would say that basically there's something going on in the mind where it's like it's starting to not be so tolerant of, of the mind wandering. You know, now it's, there's a focusing happening now. And that's a good thing because, because you have invited it, because you have said, yes, I, I want this. Then that's where the invitation is, and that's, that's why it's, it's quite intense. Mm. Yeah, I was even just kind of like after that, yeah, just like almost like flu-like symptoms coming up or something. I don't really relate with that word flu or cold, but it's, it's like feels like something moving through, but I would even get these like little blisters or something on inside of my lip and it would always be the only time that would happen when there would be something to do with a relationship or a specialness that was there like but I remember you telling a story about I don't know I forget her name but you had two two people with you traveling on the road and one of them was so unable to get in touch with what it was that her body just broke out in some kind of hives or something like that and I didn't really like that idea that unable to get in touch with it so that's why there's like a prayer to like I, rather than, you know, <laughs> breaking out in that. It's funny because none of this comes to me until like hours before the show, so I have no choice. <laughs> like, so yeah, I'd rather get in touch with what it is. So then with that one, this is what number two is. So there's a, der a deeply buried, there's a deeply buried specialness, but it's not with a person. It's with an identity, a good boy, trying to do everything right. At this point, having a relationship would cover that over and displace the anger and emotions. It's time to get in touch with the true cause of the specialness, paragraph, meaning the good boy, specialness, and the cause, the desire to be right. So when I wrote that, I was... <laughs> Yeah, I don't really like hearing that. <laughs> I don't know. So no one wants to be wrong, but it's actually a faster way to heaven. Be willing to be wrong about everything. No, no defense of any move you make. This will allow you to see your true motives. So that's that's number two. But something with me really relate, relates with it. But there's like a real challenge because. 
with the position I'm in and like training for the, what do you call it, the turn, there's like probably a hundred decisions every day whether I say something or don't say it says something or, you know, I almost want to say enforce what does I say, but when I say that I think that's where the, the rightness lies with me, is somehow in that word enforce and so I kind of want to... I don't want permission that I don't have to enforce and that communication's enough, but yeah, I don't know if we speak to that and then maybe specifics will come to me, but. <laughs> well, you know how much Jeffrey really likes the rules for decision and there's, that's actually one of those uh, saving grace moments in the rules for decision where Jesus is saying at one point, it, it, it starts to dawn on you that you would be better off if you were wrong. Uh, he comes he comes right out in Rules for Decision, and he says, you know, you, you really have to to find that point where you'd be better off if you were wrong. And that's, I, I listened a bit to Ricky and Emily where they had that impasse pretty <laughs> recently where they weren't even, like, Ricky's like, well, yes. Guess you're leaving. Guess you're moving out to another house. I guess I'll do the show on my own. And you know, this was like <laughs> right before. Like you know, you talk about being spontaneous with your show. They, you know, Ricky's first show had special guest Emily. Well, actually, we got into a fight, and <laughs> <laughs> but actually, they actually described it so poignantly that that point where they both um, reached that better off if I were wrong, you know, it's yeah. like, and, uh, and I think Jeffrey and Frank addressed it as well. It's like, it's a huge surrender point. Te Jeffrey was saying, it's like, it's, it seems like it's all surrender. And, and, and Emily was talking about that and how, how the self concepts are always where is where the specialist comes in because, um, there can be some pride involved in, in even being a spiritual leader. Uh, in even thinking, oh, I've put years into discernment and I'm a competent um, spiritual leader and people look to me for wisdom and to make the right decisions and so forth. It's, you see how subtle it is because it's still personhood heaped on with all this other kind of spiritual stuff, which, which can only be specialness because there really aren't persons at all. Sometimes I, I remember... The, there's a lot of things in the Bible that I thought was pretty wacky, but there was one part in the Bible that said, God is no respecter of persons. And, you know, now reading the Course, I just, that one really uh, hits home. It's like, wow, uh, God, you know, God is the creator of spirit and God is no respecter of persons because God didn't create persons. And, the undoing of the personal perspective is is really where you get to the core of sin because really there aren't many mistakes. Uh, there's just one mistake, and that's believing you can substitute a personal identity for a Christ identity. That's but again, that's a, that's a mistake on a, on a huge scale. So it's covered over by layers of pride and deception and belief in personal choices and all kinds of things that are just camouflage and smoke screens for that seemingly identity mistake is really what it is. So I think it's good in the sense that that's what I, I'd say over these last weeks and months, you know, as the new kind of way was coming in with, uh, with uh, you know, the overseers and, and ninjas and, and working this and this is that that now it's kind of getting closer and closer to that that point in the mind where it's like, oh, I would, I'm, I'm better off if I were wrong. That was one of the early talks I gave back in the 1990s, and I think it's still on the Internet on that the Course of Miracles .org, uh, website, but it's, it's better off if I were wrong. And, and basically that whole talk really uh, is tied in with rules of decision for decision, but it's also tied into the serenity prayer uh, because basically there's what you can control and what you cannot control and then the wisdom to know the difference. So the, the entire Course in Miracles can be 
summarized in the serenity prayer uh, of the 12 steps. And in, in that sense, the ego keeps flaring up because it's sure that it's right about something. Uh, it's sure that it's right about some decisions. It, it is absolutely uh, indignant. It is insulted by the idea that the ego has never been right about anything, not one single decision, not one single opinion, not one single declaration has ever been true in any sense of the word. And so the ego is personally insulted by the belief that it has zero contribution to make to the truth. You know, the, to the ego, it's like, oh, come on, you gotta, there's got to be something there. And, and then zero contribution to the truth. So to me, this is where... You know, you were saying, it's like the journaling was saying, there's a good boy kind of concept and, and there's a pride with the, the good boy concept. There's a pride with, you know, I've, I've made some pretty good decisions along the way. There's a pride with, um, it can be even around spirituality, there's a pride that, that's tied into um, personhood in the sense that it's like a, a spiritual person or a spiritual being among beings, you know, those are all just constructs too that, that are all getting washed away by the light. And, and I feel like that's, that's like the core of it now where, where you can't push it off or project it off into an interpersonal relationships because the, the, the pride is not in the person, the interpersonal relationships, it's in the mind and it's been hiding there. That's what the unconscious is. It's an attempt to, to push out of awareness and hide something, hide specialness, hide pride, and so forth. And now it's more of a, a just a diving and a going within moment by moment and, and really coming to a surrender point where you actually have to come to that point and say, okay, I've been wrong about everything. What does that even mean, I've been wrong about everything? Well, I've been wrong about the way that ego set this world up. And how did this ego set the world up, except as a very interpersonal, divisive experience where there seems to be separate people with private minds and private thoughts. And the whole basis of the dream world, the whole underpinnings of it is, is based on a decision that I can be right about a, a a, a false identity, an alternate identity. That's, that's where the rightness is. It's not really right about uh, specific decisions. It's more the attempt to be right about a false identity. And that's what the final surrender is, is I, I'm better off if I was wrong about all of it. And that's the surrender that's coming. Mm. Yeah, I don't know if I fully... I get the whole being wrong about everything. I I get wrong about like there was an example today where a bunch of things happened or yesterday, and I I felt like somebody was could have been used better, basically. And as soon as I put my toe in that direction, it was just like this blowback, and and I saw that regardless of the specific or seeing a specific as right, it was like where's it coming from? was wrong and that that negates everything you know or trumps everything so to speak and yeah it's funny you, yeah you said that about the relationship that it gets displaced that's what one of the journaling okay ready for the next one <laughs> <laughs> yes okay three, leading and following these concepts are now meaningless for you so there's no need to teach them like, you know, when we first built Moodle, you know, Kirsten and I, or we had like leader follower for a time, and some people it was really helpful when there's a strong, you know, submissive dynamic to get, to get into their strength, Jesus will sometimes put them in leadership, or a strong, um, they want to be the boss, egoically, Jesus will put them in the follower, just to wash away the dynamics, and I've really understood that well. <laughs> 
the <clears throat> listening to the Spirit is obviously valuable, meaning that listen, follow, He leads, we follow. But still, a better metaphor is walking with Christ. I will pick you up whenever you are unable. I had that vision of like, uh, you know, that sand, there's that famous sand poem where, what's it called? The Footprints in the sand. Footprints yeah. in the sand where the person's complaining because there's only one set of footprints and why weren't you with me? <laughs> He's like, I carried you. <laughs> Talk about misperception. You know, misperception. <laughs> I'll pick you up whenever you're unable. So what I want you to teach is God dependency. This is how you'll step out of areas that are not for you. Somehow that made sense to me because a lot of my time is like sorting out, okay, who's, who's that for and who's this for and is that one to be lifted up or that? And it's like, it's, I'm losing it now. I'd like to constantly teach God dependency. Constantly trying to help others is a sign that you don't believe they're capable of listening to Christ. So, I guess it's the same thing. I'm feeling it's like a permission question because I hear a voice at the same time that's like, well, if you do that, you know, the way the ministry has, there has been a, a, a listening following and you would do well to listen to others that have come before and even the messengers. I don't think I've ever said this publicly, but early on we kind of had a shared agreement that you would do well to follow the elder brother approach, meaning someone who's happy like you, you were happy. Okay, let's, Let's do well to listen to that. And in ways, we kind of gave that over to others as they came in. And I, I don't want to lose that, like the trust and the, like what people have gone before us and done that and, and we've done that for others. I don't want to lose that, but something in me is like, I can't. You've got to listen because somebody else is this or someone else. It's like, it's, it's dead to me. It doesn't go with God dependency, but I, there's like a fear that I'm, Everything is going to collapse. If I do. So I can't leave a famous. But go ahead. Yeah. Well, you know, I talked about this at one time at a Course in Miracles conference. I said every deep, authentic spiritual tradition has has a respect for all that has been done, um, whether it's Native American or Christian or Buddhist or whatever. But uh, there's an just that honoring feeling, but uh, we've just like we had our FIP event, um, uh, not this summer, but the previous summer. It was just like a, it was like a gratitude. Thank you for everyone for playing your part uh, so brilliantly, so perfectly, and I honor that with every part of my soul because I'm so grateful. But it doesn't make any sense um, if you try to put it out kind of on a linear way, like the ones who have come before, because linear time is an invention of the ego, and, and we're going into the holy instant. You know, that's, that's what our online retreat was, you know, going, in, going into the mystic, entering the holy instant. You know, we're, we're giving our devotion over to the holy instant now, and we're not giving it into the things of time. In fact, it, it doesn't even make sense about those who went before. What do you mean? Prepare you now for the undoing of what never was, <laughs> Jeffrey <laughs> stated on his show, you know. There we go. Now we're, we're really kicking into gear. And that's a zooming towards the holy instant. So also what that means, though, is that there's a part in the Course that, you know, I've emphasized a lot depending on different times and everything. But you know how I love the setting the goal section uh, because that's uh, zooming into the holy instant. When you put the goal out front, when you set the goal, you will see everyone and everything playing their part perfectly. And that's the, the transition you're in right now. It's not going to make sense in terms of thinking of people as people. It's not going to make sense in thinking of leaders and followers because it's too personal. Those metaphors are like washing away, washing away, no longer helpful. But think of it in terms of your mind. If you have in your mind this torch of peace, like you're really saying and meaning, I want the peace of God. I, I want to be truly peaceful. I want to know the mind 
of Christ that is my mind that, that was created by God, when you put that out in front, you are trusting in the deepest way. You're not trusting in flesh. You're not trusting in people. You're not trusting in time and space. You're trusting that if you put that goal, that torch out in front, then you will be shown by the Holy Spirit that all things work together for good that everyone is playing their part perfectly. And what's another way of describing that but to start to realize that, that you cannot judge anything. You cannot judge a person. You can't judge who's ahead and who's behind. You cannot judge who got the lesson and who didn't. You cannot judge and say, oh, you could have done better or this would have been a better choice than that choice. Because why? Because that's not the lesson. The lesson is that all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. That lesson transcends all the other stepping stones. Mm. That's, that lesson is saying, let those, oh, those rungs of the ladder, they were there to, to serve you, but now it's time to drop the ladder. It's time to drop the ladder put your faith in the light. And this is a, a state of, of watching without judgment. It's like a witness self that's just beholding the perfection of all things and beholding that, that it's always been perfect, that there has never been anything out of divine order. That's the God dependency too. It takes great trust. You'll see that there's even amazing articulate, enthusiastic spiritual teachers, but when it comes down to the question of evil, they will buckle. Uh, they will say, well, there is evil, and we have to do something about it. Oh, yeah? Well, who created that evil? You know, where did that evil come from? God? You know, you know, if, if there is something other than love, then, then it has to have a source. And, and the teachings of the Course is that attack is impossible. And once you start to get into the att attack is impossible, then you start to get into invulnerability, you start to get into divine innocence, you really become dependent on your source, which is just pure love, and you start to see yourself as pure love. And, and that's where this is is all heading. So it's a different lesson, you know, it's, it's a lesson now where you, you can't use the stepping stones that you used before. You know, it's, they could still come through you, like let's say you, you're traveling around and there's some, something that's presented and somebody comes up to you and says, um, why, why do I feel so weak? Uh, what's going on in my life, and, you know, it still can come through the mouth. Well, you need empowerment, and you need to step into a sense of leadership. You know, you can still actually, the words can even come out, even if you don't even believe in them. <laughs> and I remember that was a strange phase for me where I'd be counseling somebody, and I'd be saying things, and I'll, I'd just sit there, with, after they'd go away, I'd sit there, I'll be damned, I don't even believe in that stuff. And, and you spoke all those words to that person and they were nodding and going, well, thank you, thank you, that was so helpful. <laughs> and then I'm walking away and I'm going, I didn't even believe in half the stuff I just spoke. And the spirit's like, yeah, well, how do you feel? I said, yeah, I feel good. <laughs> it's, like, it's like, yeah, that's it, surrender, let me use the puppet and don't judge the words that come out of your mouth even and i'm like oh gosh you know it's like it's so deep that there's no sense of ownership even with words or or how you're used it's just going for that idea that everyone is playing their part perfectly and that you cannot judge and discern in between the parts anymore you know that's where the the holistic perception is taking over in the mind yeah because we actually had um we had a beautiful talk, a bunch of us, yesterday on a call just around relationships being the key. Like, none of this makes sense in terms of, but I said this or this, unless there's a relationship underneath from love. And I told stories about me with you in the, quote, early days and early for me. 
But one thing I wanted to go into, you said, was um, all things work together for good transcends um, all the metaphors. And Jesus also says in the development of trust section that it takes great learning to see that all things work together for good. And now you must, so after that, now you must discern which things are most helpful. So is that phase of discerning what's most helpful, are all of those metaphors above these other ones that I've mentioned? Like, yeah, how do you, I don't know how you put all that together. Because I always saw discerning what was most helpful was sometimes above. Yeah, I think you know what I'm saying, but. Yeah, yeah, there's, it's pretty early on in the development of trust where, you know, having seen that that all things are helpful and then the teacher of God must learn uh, to see which things increase the helpfulness. Uh, but actually that part that, uh, that Jeffrey was quoting, you know, it takes great learning to see that all events and circumstances and so forth, you know, are for, for the good, you know, are, are for the good. That, that is the, the top of the line because that's where, that's kind of, you could say that's the end of the line because mm -hmm. uh, that's, there is no higher uh, mm -hmm. learning than seeing that all things work together for good. You know, that's like seeing that the script is written. That's like seeing that you can't change the world. Mm -hmm. Because why? Because you've just changed your mind about the world. That's like saying purpose is the only choice. Mm -hmm. There is nothing higher than that purpose that Jesus was saying, you know, Jeffrey was quoting that part, that thing, everything must be first forgiven before it can be understood. And that understanding, there is nothing higher than that understanding. Because, because when the forgiveness comes, you see the nothingness of the world and the, and the realness of, of the, the, forgiven, the mind. You know, when it's forgiven, it's opened up to its, its authentic, true self. So... You know, I would see this as, as you getting to the point where it's really like letting go. You know, it comes to a point where it's just like practicing the presence where you're, you're just saying so in touch with your state of mind and so into the goal of what this is all about, which is that, that peace that passeth the understanding of the world. And then, and you're really having faith and trust to let everything else go. The ego may say, oh, the ministry's going to go downhill uh, when, <laughs> when you aren't there, like, overseeing the overseers or, or whatever, you know. But that's just the ego tempting, tempting the mind. But, no, things are going to always be working together for the good. It's not, nothing changes. Mm. Uh, there is no entropy. There is no falling apart. There is no chaos uh, because that was just the belief in dependence on the ego and the things of the ego. And you're going to be teaching and learning God dependence that everything is, comes from God. Uh, that's what true divine providence is where you keep it in your mind that everything that you're experiencing is coming from God. It's a gift from God. There are no personal motives. There are no special people, and so on and so forth. And that watching, that feeling and experiencing that divine providence, that's what the prayer of the heart was always, to be just totally 100% God-dependent. And that was the simplicity of everything. That's all it was for. That's why we say all glory to God. That's why... It ends up being just a big thank you, and just a repeating thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I need to do four and five. <laughs> <laughs> it's washing away. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, this is kind of a funny one, but it's pain. Pain is, yeah, pain is a wrong-minded decision because I've been really practicing with this after the surgery, just feeling any discomfort or watching it go away, then come back and first seeing if there's any thoughts seemingly associated with it. But, but really the only thing that truly frees me is, is that section. Uh, 
I don't know where it's from, but uh, he said, you know you've practiced well when you do not feel the body at all. And that's the only thing. It's not like a certain cure works or you do this and, yeah. Six, yeah. 136? Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's just getting down to the core of, of mind watching. I mean, that's what all the mind watching was for is just to, to come to that place of watching the mind, seeing if there's anything that still comes up that's, that's attractive or repulsive. And, and uh, so it's the, the seeming pleasureful things, whether it seems to be psychologically or physically, that there are the attraction thoughts. The flip side are the repulsion thoughts, and pain uh, would be among those. And those experiences and everything, but uh, that uh, old song, you can't have one without the other. You know, that's that's uh, a teaching from the course that that is uh, very deep, and that that's something that's a relationship that the ego does not want to come into awareness. Because if that comes into awareness, then then you obviously are going to let go of it all. Mm. Uh, there's not going to be any kind of uh, hidden agenda of, of just trying to pursue something that's judged as, as pleasurable and avoid something that's judged as painful. You start to get uh, more aware that it's just the same. They're just attack thoughts, and you don't want attack thoughts. Mm, yeah, I, I love that when Ricky said on her show, um, she had a week of whatever it was, like just supreme happiness or just really in this deep presence. And then she remembers the moment it went away when a pretty girl touched her hand or something like that, grabbed her hand. I thought, oh my God, that's amazing. Like You lose the whole world when you go with it, uh, the whole real world, you know, when you go with tiny attraction. <laughs> so that's probably why he wrote, I'm serious about this. Whenever you feel anything but perfect joy, you you are identifying with a bodily identity and that is too much. It's time to crack down on this. <laughs> I'm like, can he really say crack? You know? <laughs> can the spirit of saying really crack down on this? It's another version of be vigilant only for God and his kingdom. <laughs> okay, the last one, love. You must you, so he, see, this is the thing, sometimes I get tripped up because he never commands or a man, whatever. But you must, <laughs> you now must lead by love. But if you're going to be musting anything, you might as well musting love, you know. <laughs> you now must lead by love. Only meaningful relationships of kindness and gratitude. <laughs> no more jokes to point things out. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> For jokes, the point thing. <laughs> okay, so then the last thing, I, th I feel like this goes with the whole thing because I love you. You have great expansion coming your way if you allow this practice. It's the, qu the question now becomes, am I trying to be right? Question mark. Or am I communicating? Like somehow that I don't fully get it, but it, I feel something in that as a practice. Like, it doesn't mean I stop saying things, but somehow it signifies an energy that I can really watch for underneath or something like that. So, yeah, that's that is really what we talked about in that into the mystic, and uh, when we talked about going into the holy instant. I, I was reading that that section that um, it doesn't mean that you have to be perfect or to be totally purified to enter the holy instant. It just means that you would have nothing that you would hide. Mm. So that's a key idea. You don't have purification first before you ask for the holy instant. Mm. You just have nothing that you would hide. Mm. And that's what we're always talking about. That's what Frank was talking about on the show, that it's sometimes when the, the sadness or depression or the wanting or things come up, uh, it, to voice that, to not hide that, 
to not try to recoil and hide and protect something for whatever, for fear of being unloved or rejected or all the reasons that the ego gives, that, that is so important. So you might just say that, that when it's to communicate instead of being right, it's like uh, to allow the love within you, to allow Jesus to be in charge of the miracle, to allow yourself to be open to the miracle is to allow yourself to communicate what needs to be communicated. Remembering, too, that there's just one mind. So when, when you're communicating it, you're really just teaching what you would learn. You're just strengthening it in your own mind. You're not helping anybody out. You're not saving some other person. You're just strengthening that in mind, and you want to let that, that love, that gentleness, that innocence pour through you because that's how you strengthen, oh, I am love, I am innocence, I am joy. Uh, that's how, how the whole thing works. Teach what you would learn and then teach only love for that is what you are. That's really the principle that's going on underneath that. Do I want to communicate here or do I want to, to be right about something? Mm. That's beautiful. Thank you. It is. It's soft. Yeah, it's soft it and gentle. I like softness. Yeah. There you go. Let that jaw drop. Let that neck roll. There you go. Oh. <laughs> That's beautiful. You're doing like a head meditation there. We have the whole, we'll show the gallery of you. Everyone is <laughs> in the gallery relaxing. Okay. But letting go of the spiritual self-concept. <laughs> <laughs> you're leading you're leading everyone in that. It's beautiful. Well, that's the end of my my list. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. Beautiful. Well, it's it's beautiful and it it just fits in with uh that idea, that's what God dependence is, just tuning in and, and listening. I have to say that, that uh, even though it seems the body of David and, and Lisa, Frank, we're all, Ellen, we're all over here in Portugal, but actually uh, we're just having a lot of holy encounters. We're just having lots and lots and lots, and there's no distinctions in those holy encounters. Uh, there's... there's no difference in any of them and it's it's just a, a joy in that sense it's just kind of flowing through us and and it's kind of interesting because um i think the words came out a little bit like oh david's out there again and he's out in the world and he's doing a world tour and everything no i'm i'm really not uh it's been we've been having these glorious little visits visitation uh we we're here visiting we've been visiting restaurants and visiting people and there's just all these uh visitations that are happening and it's just, just so soft and so gentle and so beautiful and then and that's uh what's coming next is things seem to be happening like like frank was mentioning there's things that are in motion with two properties over here and that's been just a bunch of wonderful visitations and uh and then Ellen's getting ready to go up and be with her family. I think it's your daughter's, uh, what is it, birthday? Yeah, my son and daughter. Son and daughter are having a birthday. So she's getting ready to go up to Holland for a big celebration, son and daughter's birthday. And Lisa and Frank are soon gearing up to go to uh, Zurich, uh, Switzerland. And uh, I'm getting ready to go to South Africa for Catherine. Uh, down there and and others that have Haley and different ones that are contacting me and so forth and then yeah up to Holland for some holy encounters here and there and around and so yeah it's just the joy of of the moment but but it's it's kind of like it's I just see these things whirling around where oh David David with his retreats or David doing this David doing that that's just kind of like those are just like symbols or past associations, but I'm just 
flowing in the moment and uh, just we have ripples of, of holy encounters uh, going on, but they're not really organized. What do you say, Lisa? It's hardly, you can hardly even say that there doesn't seem any rhyme or reason or order or organization to any of them. Um, they're just come, just happening just right before us. And, Very spontaneous. Yeah, she's saying spontaneous. Very spontaneous. And at, at times it's a little, uh, even what disorienting, because it's like, we, we were actually... Um, I was getting dizzy. Yeah, Lisa started to, to get dizzy three for three days. And then at one point, I remember looking at her and I, I said, uh, what day is it? And we had effectively, I mean, totally lost track of the day of the week. And uh, we had to look it up. And then we were like shocked. It was Saturday. <laughs> Lisa was like, do you believe it? It's, it's Saturday, you know, we were like. So, so we are effectively like kind of it's things are drifting, <laughs> drifting away, but uh, you know it's it's very intimate that way too. Like Frank was saying, you know that there's it's very deep, it's very intimate, and there's uh, you can just feel the the healing power just kind of moving through, but um, you can't really uh, put your finger on. It, you know, it would be a poor attempt to try to describe uh, what it is when it's more of a forgetting. You know, we're we're remembering who we are, and we're really forgetting everything else, and meaning the entire world. So that seems to be what's going on. If I had to put any words at all to it, mm. that's fun. <laughs> Sounds like it's in line with your God-dependent <laughs> lesson. Yeah, you're acting it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I actually mentioned Zurich too. I, Jeffrey and I went out yesterday and we were talking about it's time, like with all these different events going on, what's our inspiration? And we, we thought maybe we'll start thinking about that hike and we could fly over to Portugal sometime in July or August, or it could be September, but July, August. And then... Um, you know, get ready with the time zones and then do a week hike in the, in the Swiss Alps with Bernd and uh, maybe stay at Frank's with Frank and Zurich for a day or two before we we lunch and do this week-long hike. We don't know who or how or it's going to work out, but... <laughs> and Frank's rented apartment. <laughs> 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 That's right. He's like, well, what else is new now? <laughs> Just when <laughs> everything's falling apart, he's like, now Jason's uh, going to bring a whole gang of hikers. <laughs> My little rented space. <laughs> vestige of a, of a personal identity, and you, you're bringing a whole bunch of hikers. Just Jeffrey and I. Just Jeffrey. <laughs> oh, it's just Jeffrey and, oh. and Jason. <laughs> he can handle that. <laughs> the rest can meet us in the hike. <laughs> that's good, that's good. <coughs> Sweet. Okay, well, I don't know if to open it up or not or just kind of end it here, but I feel kind of complete. <laughs> <laughs> I think I will. Uh, I, it, what's coming to me for me is that these uh, these shows. You know, we actually there was a time change, and we could not, for the life of us, uh, figure out uh, what time it was. And and then there we were, going out at two o'clock to go to lunch, and then come over here, and then. You know, and they were so, yeah. like wait four hours. Yeah, the other day, they, they, yesterday maybe they were saying, well, no, there was a time change in Utah and Portugal. Utah and Portugal are totally in sync, and of all the places in the world, Utah and Portugal are changing their times identically and everything. And I thought, well, that sounds good. That we must be on the same time. No, so <laughs> it it's like we can't figure that out and and then you know we've you know it's it's been beautiful but i think uh i was i was thinking for a while there 
with some talk in, in with Holland and with Sweden about a retreat, and then it just dawned on me. I said, "Oh, that's right. I'm just I'm just doing these holy encounters and visits. I'm, but I I do feel the digital. So we did make our way, and we were bodies strewn out all over the place here. And we've been like waiting for a couple hours. <laughs> we had we had special desserts brought in. And des oh, we got to go four hours. Yeah. <laughs> and Lisa's like, are we on time? Uh, we're four hours early. <laughs> uh, you know, it's like so, like we've been laying in this bed, and it's like okay, we're gonna we're rest not, here. We're not good with those kind of things. But so I feel like we're we're in the rhythm of we do like these uh, retreats and and everything, but it's all digital. And then uh, it's so funny because I got an invitation to to go to. Uh, Holland, and they said, oh, we're going to have a big, huge event there and everything. And so they're going to maybe fly in from Zurich, from Zurich and they're going to, uh, <laughs> they're going to just splash in there. And uh, so the that's, day. So watch out, Amsterdam, uh, or Amersfoort, uh, uh, Amersfoort, watch out, they're going to fly in and, and just splash their light in there. So it's just a lot of uh, spontaneity that's happening with us and everything, but um, but we're just enjoying it. It's we can't make any sense of it. <laughs> look, look, look at Frank's hair. He's like flying on the bullet. <laughs> 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 Only your hairdresser knows for sure. <laughs> looks like a model. <laughs> uh, a model. A model. <laughs> <laughs> Watch out. It was like that here. We had all these postings. It's 10 a.m. CST. No, 10 a.m. CDT. No, 9 a.m. I, we I was like, I couldn't figure it out myself. We couldn't figure it out. We just showed up. It's like, let's just get there. We don't know how, what time it is, but we'll be on time. We're ready. Yeah, I think, Jason, you and I, we are losing our hair. Every time we try to think of time, we lose another hair. It just drops off. <laughs> I better stop. <laughs> We're going to be bald and beautiful here if we keep think, thinking about time. <laughs> oh, it's nice to see your joy. That's beautiful. We love you. We love you. We love you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for the show. Thanks for joining, David. Lisa, oh, Frank. Joy. Joy. Oh, I get to wave to everybody now. A casa. <laughs> yeah. It's always the best, best part. Frank, what do I do to find the gallery? Uh, Frank there. knows all the... Ah, yeah. There <laughs> they are. are. The There's gallery. Living Miracles Virtual Mexico. Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's Luz. There's Heike. Ah, I see Octavio's fingers and fan. <laughs> Jesus's fingers and glasses. Then we have another yeah, picture. Yeah, Kimberly, Joanne, Esther. There's oh, Sevi. Mexico. We're getting the center ready for you, Sevi. We're working over here in Europe. We're sowing the seeds. There's Helena. There's the gang over there in Sweden. Look, there's Dan, too, in the hospital. Yeah. Dan! Where's Dan? <laughs> this broken <laughs> arm. <laughs> Do you see him? Not on this page. Well, there's there. Bridget. <laughs> there's John. Dan, Patrick. here. There, there's Dan. <laughs> there's the brothers. It's like... It's like a, a, what was that Paul Lynn show where they had all the different squares? The Hollywood squares. Dan and John are right category. They're right there, the brothers. <laughs> oh, sweet. Dan, shine in your light there. We love it. We love I love reading your your posts on uh, Twitter. All your update posts. I'm getting a Twitter feed. There's Gail. Kelly, yeah, Patrick, Mary, Carly, Maya, Jeff, 
Just the whole Lacasa gang there. There they are. Hell there they, they are. are. Oh, yeah, that <laughs> and those big bags, bean bags, chairs. Yeah. Oh, there's Alexa. She's put herself on. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, here. beautiful. Heidi, Christopher, yeah. Look at that monastery group there. <laughs> They're at the monastery. Wow, it's just one big happy family. Mm -hmm. One yeah. big happy dream family. It's just beautiful. Gorgeous. Well, thank you for tuning in, and we love you, and uh, we're going to welcome Svava over here soon, and yes. then all kinds of things happen in here, but we'll... We'll be tuned in. We're so grateful, too, to Ruben. Uh, Ellen's son has given us the, the only place we've found over here oh where God. we could do this. That has internet. Yeah, that has internet. <laughs> so uh, we, have, we landed in the sweet spot here with Ruben's bachelor apartment. <laughs> Thank you, Ruben. <laughs> Thank you, Ruben. There's Walter, too. Hi, Walter. Okay. Okay, bye everybody. Bye.